Good evening, welcome once again to the Purdy Factory. Uh, I'm Tom Nichols, um, and tonight we're going to be moving on with our uh, journey, I guess it is now, uh, through the eight stages of gun making. So tonight I'm very lucky to be joined by Paul Chung. Um, Paul has been working in and around Purdy for many, many years now, uh, master engraver in his own right. Um, and he's going to take us through tonight some uh, techniques on engraving, notably the Purdy Fine Rose and Scroll, um, and how that is built up and how that's actually engraved, and also uh, gold work, so gold inlay and things like that. So let's go and meet Paul, um, and we can crack on and have a little look at what he's up to. Hi, right, Paul. Hello. You alright? I'm fine, thank you. All right, I'm going to move somewhere else and let any get in there. Yeah, come through. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so, as I said, Paul's been working in and around Purdy for how many years? Mate? 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. So again, another one of our long-standing craftsmen that's been working with us. Very, very skilled in what he does. Um, Thank you. Well, <laughs> got to compliment you sometimes. Um, so tonight, we're going to look at mainly what we're famous for, which is the Purdy Fine Rose and Scroll. How that's designed, how that's very organic in its, pro in its production, and how it develops into the fine... Uh, work you see on our best guns and our BTP um, as well. So I will stop talking and I'll let you start talking. <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> okay. really. Um, and what we're really interested in, I guess, is the, the, the process you would go through because it's not just like drawing, it is engraving onto a block of stick, um, which has so many different difficulties, so many different variations, yeah. variations etc. So um, as I say, I will stop talking and over to you, Paul. Um, okay, hello. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, so we're going to talk about um, small scroll. Um, I think the best way to begin is to how to form small scroll. So if I illustrate on a bit of paper, because it's actually, I've got a little bit prepared here. Uh, but you might struggle to see what I'm actually doing. It's just for um, illustration purposes. Um, so when we begin to design the scroll work, this is the basic way we do it. Uh, we begin with something like a starting scroll. Like we say, it's organic, it's supposed to be, uh, represent a plant and how it flows. So everything's got to come off something like that, smoothly. You would build a scroll work up within your perimeter. So say like we have a triangle. Um, so obviously I'll leave a little space for outside work. Apologise for the rough drawing. Um, yeah, so we build a scroll work up in the space. If it's too big like that, we put another little scroll in there, just fill it in. Until we fit the perimeter that we're given. Very crude, this. So, uh, and once we've done that, we start cutting what we call the spine of the scroll. So we cut all that, uh, and then come to the filling per, uh, process. So we literally get a, a graver, and we do literally just cut thin. And then with varied, varied strengths, thin to thick, in. Etc. And we fill it all in. Um, I could demonstrate on this, this bit here. Yeah, so it's probably quite a good time to talk about the tools as well, because drawing yep. with the pen, it's, it's there, but actually you're going to be cutting the, the steel, so yeah there's a, a knack to do small scroll actually um, uh, 
with your normal gravy, you can have it quite thick. Uh, it, it doesn't really affect the the cut. But with small scroll, there's a knack to it. Uh, basically, we want to make this, the uh, the gravy quite springy. So I've set this one up. You can actually see there's actually a little spring to it. Yeah. So when we come to fill it in, do the flicks, we literally use the spring to flick uh, the metal out. So it's something I prepared earlier so I could demonstrate. So like I was saying in, in the drawing, so you go thin and then you go a bit stronger and flick. And then you try and build up a rhythm. So that's your guide. And then thick. It's quite nice to do once you get into it because you build up a rhythm. So I'll do it to a natural speed now. Um, yeah, when you get into it, it's just. the first one done that's a starting scroll there's some scrolls are marked out here that I haven't cut yet but we've got um, modern technology we use these um, grave engraving machines that actually literally just vibrates in the olden days we uh, do everything by hand we still do use the, the hand tools but these are a, a godsend it actually makes the job slightly easier Sorry, let me set it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in the old days we used to push this, but this actually helps a lot. You've got less chance of slipping with these things. And we do slip. There's ways of getting around it. It depends how big the slip is, <laughs> basically. Normally it's superficial, so you could just burnish it out. Uh -huh. uh, if it goes a bit more haywire, a bit more deeper, there's ways of getting out of it. Well, I might show that later. Is another tool in the box, yeah. Basically, um, my own take on it is uh, you should you should um, learn to do both because mm -hmm. there's some things that works better with these, mm -hmm. and uh, some things you can do better with a hand tool. Um, when I come to do gain scenes and something a bit more fine, mm -hmm. I actually use the hand tool. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot more control. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, because it's fine um, with the heavy stuff, uh, I use the hammer and chisel or or the engraving machines. So, so during your apprenticeship, you would learn purely with the hand tool. Yeah, uh, when when I started, we didn't have none of these, so uh, it's predominantly push push graver that I learned on. Um, basically, when I first started, you learn how to do straight lines um, to get the feel of the tool basically and then you progress on to like circles um, uh, and when I did my apprenticeship you're under um, a tutor if you like uh, we were called Gaffer mm -hmm. yeah. yeah Gaffer yeah Gaffer uh, and he oversees what you do basically um, 
Yeah, so they, they start you off on, on little things like pins and what have you, and if they think that you could do a bit more, they might give you like a part of the gun to do. They wouldn't give the whole thing to do. Uh, I might start on something like on the side, uh, knob scrolls, and they just build, build you up until you're confident um, enough to do the whole thing. Um, Do you think your apprenticeship, the training using just the hand tools has made you a better engraver over the years? Um, Even with the technology coming on board, do you think that's made you realise that you could use the technology better? I, I'm, I'm actually glad that I learned on the, on the, on the hand tools. Because uh, like I said, uh, with doing pictures and stuff like that, it's, it's actually um, yeah, better with the hand tools and get more control of it. Um, but with the heavier stuff, uh, we used to use the ham and chisel. Yeah, I still use the ham and chisel, but it's varying techniques. Yeah. So I use everything, whatever at your dis disposal to make your job easier. So yeah, I mean, we've got, you and I have worked together for a long period long of time. Period, now, yeah. yeah, a long, long time. So I've seen all the work you've done over the years. I've seen you use acids for etching out backgrounds. Yeah. I've seen you use hammer and chisel. I've seen you use the grave mat hand tool. Interestingly, we just had a question that came in as to why we don't use lasers. Um, why don't we use lasers? Because we have, because this, this is, this is what it's all about. This is craft, this is hand. This is a man's skill that he's perfected, he's spent his life perfecting um, to do it. And that's, that's what it is. You can look at laser engraving, there's a lot of it out there. Um, but when you really look into the, the, the background of it, it's not the same. No. This is, I would say, from a, as, a, as a finisher by my, my normal trade, it, it's alive. When you move it in the light and you move it backwards and forwards and you move it around, you can see the definition, you can see the There's shape. There's no the variation in depth with uh, yeah. laser engraving. Um, it has its place in, in many products. Yeah. Um, and th there's no hiding behind it. There is, there is a technology, but for our, for our very, very best lines like this, this, this is where we are. This is, this is what we do. Um, and it all falls into the bespoke nature. Last, last time out, we were talking about stocking um, and we were talking about the really bespoke nature of the uh, measurements that, that the uh, customer has taken. So they have a completely bespoke stock. There is no limit apart from sizes, um, so sort of like bearing sizes on an action body and on the plates. There's no limit to what you can actually embellish these guns with. In Europe it's called embellishment, over here we call it engraving. Um, but there's no I've seen guns over the years that have had deep carving, massive deep carving, uh, animals, gold, all kinds of stuff, all of which are beautiful in their own right and all of which are very personal to the person who's actually purchasing the gun. Um, the technique that Paul's using now is uh, quite often called standard fine. Um, I like to say that there is actually nothing standard in a Purdy. Uh, this is Purdy Fine Rose and Scroll. So yes, it is the most traditional. It does have the most history behind it. It is also one of the most beautiful. So um, that's why we want to demonstrate this tonight. So, a long-winded reason as to why we don't use lasers. Yeah. So what I'm doing here with a hand graver is called push, gra push graver technique. So we're literally pushing using varying degrees of strength. It's actually quite delicate. You said a question coming, Paul. Yes. Why do you wear double spectacles? <laughs> One's for seeing <laughs> the other is just the reading glasses because <laughs> my eyes is not as good as it used to be a lot of gun use, use double glasses sometimes yeah. very focals are a little bit too much half and half aren't they you can't yeah can't get the, the when i first started i, I actually done this with a naked wife i was doing that's just a blur <laughs> that's just a blur at the moment <laughs> so double glasses is old age and bad eyes yeah rather than that as well eyes. okay cool and the nature of the job yeah the nature of the job so that's why we got this. Uh, we I use the microscope so for for various things. Uh, depend again on what what we do. So, yeah, this is small scroll basically. Um, I know. So I scroll hit me in the face. So Sorry, I'm back the I know. <laughs> I know. I remember my old gaffer used to be uh, left-handed, mm. but some bright spot as he used to sit this. Mm -hmm. This way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to sit here and we used to flick things at each other. <laughs> so... <laughs> it was your gaffer? Huh? My gaffer, I was actually blessed to uh, have a couple of uh, juices. Mm -hmm. um, so I started off under Martin Bublik. Mm -hmm. 
he taught me how to do small scroll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as you know, I left there and went up somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a, a, a another gaffer uh, who was a massive help actually. His uh, his name was Ken Prater. I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> so he was the foreman at Holland Holland, and uh, he showed me stuff that I haven't learned, basically. Um, so yeah, you just come across people in your life, in your career, that show you things, you know, um, that you don't know. And then, and then obviously, and now obviously, uh, it, back in the 90s when I first started as well, we had all these amazing stuff that used to come through by, by like people like Ken Hunt, Bill Coggan, Brown Brothers, and that like, it's an inspiration for you. So it's, it's an inspiration for you. Because I used to look at their stuff when they come in. That's one of the way I used to learn as well. You know, I used, to, I used to look at their stuff. I was be blown away by it. I used to study, you know, with an eyeglass, look at every cut they do, how they do it. And that's how I learned how to do the game scenes and things yeah. like that as well. Basically, putting the, how to put the lines together. Um, so I, cool. I got. Uh, yeah, that's actually quite an interesting gun, though, really. Just got a, a small skull here. <laughs> they just done this. I actually done this about ten years ago. So this is what we call a large scroll and game scene gun. Yeah. So game scene is another process of uh, you set the tool up a uh, uh, different way as well because it's so fine. Uh, all the, the angles that you set your tool up makes all the difference. So when you're doing game scenes, you, you have it at a really low angle. Can you turn it around? Sure. Can you turn, turn it around? around? Yep, yeah. <laughs> that's the other side. So when we're talking about the very personal nature of, of the engraving for the, for the customer, so um, when it comes to large scroll, um, there are many, many different types. And over the years, many different engravers have developed their own large scrolls. When we're saying large scroll, it's the bigger scrolls you see on the gun there. Mm -hmm. Different engravers, different styles, different stuff. So we've got the very traditional stuff, which is that, I would say. And you've got the acanthus sleeves. You've got all kinds of different large scrolls. I'll say colors. something about small scroll as well. It's almost like handwriting. Um, so you get different engravers doing yeah, small definitely. scroll. Yeah, yeah. You, you can normally tell who's done it. You know, they've all got their own little mm -hmm. clicks in there. Well, even to the left hand and, and the right hand, because I know Martin Bubbit. Yes, yeah, so he does his uh, uh, not scroll the other way, doesn't he? So. Yeah, he's left handed, so. Um, yeah. He does it the other way around, so it's uh, yeah, very different. The the game scenes as well is something we always find is very personal to the, to the customer. So it would generally be a bird, a scene, an area where they've been shooting or they love, or just something that's very very personal to them. So we spend a lot of time, with guys like Paul, who's already mentioned, Phil Coggan, Simon Coggan, Stefano Pedretti, these sort of guys. A lot of time doing a lot of design work as well. So making sure the customer expectation is being managed so they get exactly what they want. And it's so personal. This is like a, this is like a painting engraved. Yeah, you, you often have to do a lot of design work on paper. It's, uh, it's a commission at the end of the day. Yeah, a lot when there's something a bit more personal, you have to do a drawing like something I've done here earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, was do, I was doing some really crude drawing here. It wasn't very good. But that was uh, because we're time limit limited. But that's something I've done through earlier. That's the uh, design. So, yeah, when you build it up, it all comes to life. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it, isn't it? This, this, is, this is as much personalization as, as the measurements are. That's, that's, that's the thing. Um, Right. Awesome. Do you want to um, do you want to talk a little bit about gold? Yep. And gold inlay and things like that. Yeah. Got gold inlay. So obviously, gold, gold work <coughs> is uh, a bit more advanced stuff. Um, I was saying about lettering as well. Um, is actually <laughs> one of the hardest things to do because everyone knows what lettering looks like, so it's got to be right. Um, so. What are we talking about? Gold. <laughs> gold gold inlay. properties of gold. Gold inlay, right. Gold, et cetera, et cetera. I actually got something here that I'm working on at a minute, um, which I've partly prepared just for this Instagram live. 
So, yeah, I was just about to inlay some rose gold into this. Now, rose gold is not the easiest metal to work with. Um, because this particular one is 18 carats. So anything lower than 22 carats is actually quite hard. Uh, if it's just like 22 carat or 24 carat gold that we use, it's actually quite soft. You can literally just push it in and then, and then smash it and it will spread. Um, so when we do gold inlay, we cut a channel in, you see? So that's prepared, it's partly prepared. And then we've got to undercut it with a really sharp tool. It has to be sharp to get under. Um, so basically by quickly explain so that we've got this is a cross section of a channel of my line so yeah so we have to undercut it with a tool sharp and we want to do a is it dovetail yeah yeah call it yeah, dovetail. dovetail so yeah we'll be cutting channels like that that's what holds the gold in it's not glued in or welded but literally so we've got cross section like that and maybe something like that. I'll be using wire. So if you imagine that that's the cross section of the wire, I'll whack it in and that should all spread under there. And whack it in. Dig a hole and whack it in. Then. Dig a hole and whack it in, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, uh, it's actually quite tedious. Uh, <laughs> uh, doing, doing, doing all the um, undercutting takes actually quite, quite a bit of time. But that's what holds it in. So I've prepared a bit well, uh, that I haven't quite finished yet, but it's going to be a bit noisy, so I apologise in advance. <laughs> okay, where are we? Right. This is where these come in really handy, actually. <coughs> you set up. These are brilliant for doing undercutting, and uh, I do it under the scope because. I can see everything. And uh, preparation is key on this. Because if you don't get the undercutting right, we may cause problems uh, further along the line. So, I've only got a little bit to do on this, so just bear with me. rose gold in now rose gold like i was saying is actually really hard it's a hard metal to work with um so it needs to be a nil but well, it's actually a special way of doing it as well so to kneel it certain things you've got to watch out for with rose gold with normal gold 22 carat or 24 carat um you don't really need to anneal it because it's so soft. With this, 18 carat and, and lower. So what I'll do, the internet is a, is a marvel. <laughs> so I, I was actually struggling with this before and I went on a jewelry forum and uh, which told me how to exactly do this properly. You mustn't air cool it because you imagine Rose gold is basically 75% gold uh, with between 25 and 30% copper, maybe 5% silver in it. Um, so we use a quenching technique. So why you should use alcohol, this is just 
methylated spirits, which is wood alcohol. And unlike other metals, we get cherry red and then quench. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You mustn't get this cherry red because apparently it messes up the, the properties of the metal. Does that affect the colour? No, it affects the, uh, the nature of it uh, okay. and it tends to crack right. with rose okay. gold. It's a brittle apparently. One, Yeah, it makes it brittle. If you get a cherry red and let air cool especially, you, yeah. imagine the atoms are different. Yeah, so yeah. If they're trying to separate. Mm -hmm. so this is what they told me. So. <laughs> but, but it actually makes sense. You it's know. fascinating, so especially if it works when you, yeah. when you try something. No, like I mean, it like, uh, took me a couple of goes to get it right, but when I got it right, it actually was soft and yeah. you could feel it. So, so it is a bit fiddly. A bit worried it's going to hit me in the face. I don't want to ping somewhere, I'll lose it. You know <laughs> let's, not, let's not do that. So, right, you mustn't use a blue flame. Blue flame will just melt it, mm -hmm. basically. So, um, right, I use a yep, I should do this in the forge, but a yellow flame, that's a yellow flame. So, it's just your normal common law cigarette lighter. Yeah, I'm, I would normally do it in the forge, but it's all the way over there, so. Mm -hmm. All right, you see it turning black. Don't worry about that. That's just, that's just uh, cold oxidizing. So you just heat it. That black, sooty stuff will actually disappear after a while. And that's when you know it's ready to quench. Someone actually said you should do this in the darkened room. Mm -hmm. Oops, that bit is melted, but I'll cut it off, don't worry. So you can see like a really dull red. Is that what you actually get? Is it you get a dull red? You, you need a really dull red. Okay. That's why, you, 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 you know, don't use a blue flame, otherwise it just turn red. I love these techniques, doing a darkened room and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you see the black's actually burnt off. It's turning slightly blue. That tells me it's nearly ready. And you have to quickly quench it in the alcohol. You could do it in water, but yeah. apparently with alcohol, it's, um, a, a gentler. Yeah, I mean, we, a use, we use meths a lot when we're um, tempering steel and quenching that as well. But again, same, same sort of reason. <laughs> <laughs> thought you knew. No. So, yeah, that's, that's soft. It's softer. It's softer than what it was. That bit I've melt, that's melted, I'll just cut that off later. But I actually got a bit, a bit that's prepared here before. So, that's already been annealed. <laughs> Glasses. <clears throat> so like I said, use whatever technique works for you. Uh, or every engraver got their own techniques. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'll actually just try and whack this in first go. Because uh, obviously with metal, you know, if you hit it, it'll work hard. Yeah. 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 So you're trying to avoid that as much as possible. The least impact as possible. So you yeah. avoiding the work hard. So, I hopefully, I'll prepare this properly. So There's a lot of people watching. We see. Them, so. I know. <laughs> the pressure's on. <laughs> no pressure. Right. So, like I said, so whatever works. I yeah. actually got a, 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 a rusty nail here. But it's iron. Yeah. So, it's softer than the steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I shouldn't hit it anyway. Because, in theory, it should hit the... Hit the, cotton, uh, hit, hit the uh the wire first so So you just go along the bit that I've undercut. So it's what I explained before, you're hitting it and it's going down into the channels and into the dovetail. That's what's holding it.
Well, that's in there. So what we're trying to do now is just to make sure it's filled up all the gaps. So I'll be, I'll be hitting it <coughs> towards the dovetail. Yep. Yeah. So instead of going this way, because mm -hmm. it's just gonna come out this way. Yeah. So I'm gonna hit, hit it towards, just up and down, just to make sure it goes in all the gaps, nooks and crannies, because there's a dovetail that's, that's gonna hold it. want to leave some um, gold to play with mm -hmm. because when you clean it down you might have missed a bit so what we do now good old elbow grease so this is your burnishing tool yep that's burnishing tool hardened steel so we push polished. it to whatever bit you missed and I've still got some gold to play with. Now what I'll do now <coughs> is to take as much off the top as possible, mm -hmm. but not completely, mm -hmm. yeah? So I still have some gold to play with. Still got some more burnishing room if you've yep. got a few gaps. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know what's underneath there at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'll change it to a, what you call a flat. Which is you just a gray bar made into a flat quite sharp mm -hmm. but take the bulk of this and then i'll go through the stones mm -hmm. to make it flush okay. so again i'll use <laughs> this because i can see everything which helps <laughs> oh, that's a good thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> you don't need to use it you can just stone it down if you want to mm -hmm. because you can actually see the highlight of where you've done that in the cut because when you're undercutting, you actually throw uh, the size of the metal up. Mm -hmm. And when you come to clean it, you can actually see the, the, co the contrast in the colours. Okay. But, that, but yeah. This is giving you quite a lot then of you know where, Yeah, you know whether it's like too high or not. These are quite small areas. Yeah. Um, if I was to do a big area like a bird, uh, what have you, I would actually use sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you get the shape of the bird or mm -hmm. buffalo or whatever, um, and yeah, you literally cut cut out the piercing saw, mm -hmm. the actual shape, and you know. Sim got, similar technique. Similar technique. Like yeah. Larger surface. How but do you I'll, do the background of a larger area? You, larger see? area, I will reinforce it. So obviously, um, I'll undercut all the edges, mm -hmm. um, like what we've done here. So in certain sections, I'll re reinforce it by putting a couple of channels. Yep. Yeah. Then I'll undercut that. Mm -hmm. But in between all that as mm -hmm. well, I will use a technique called uh, dam sieving. Um, dam sieving is basically loads of lines mm -hmm. right next to each other. Mm -hmm and you do it in a cross. Okay. So you've got these little spikes okay. that comes up yeah. that reinforces as well. So you've got the, on the edges, the undercut to, to hold it, and then certain lines to reinforce it in the middle, and then you don't have to do that, but that's what I do. So I don't, I don't, no, want, the thing, thing, I don't so, want the thing falling out. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of other processes this is gonna go through this done. So you obviously at the very end of this, you've got the recoil. Yeah. Um, so there's quite heavy forces going through there, so you don't want loose pieces of gold being able to drop off your gun. 
During the finishing process, we also have the heat treatment of the action body, um, which is, is exposed to some fairly serious temperatures. So again, with the shrink, it was with the expansion and the shrinking of the steel, this gold isn't really in here and held in really well with the risk of it falling out again. So what Paul's doing here is incredibly important because you don't want to and you can't replace the gold later on uh, once the hardening process has taken place. So this is this is critical for what Paul's doing. I mean, Peter's been uh, decorating arms for millennia you know so what impresses me was you ever seen the armors mm -hmm. yeah yeah they used to do that centuries ago like suits of armor yeah. suits of armor yep. yeah and back then obviously they was etching it yeah they was etching it and then putting the gold in so it's similar technique to all them centuries ago so when you look at stuff even going back a couple of centuries not, yep. not the 600 700 years ago the techniques you're using now Especially with the hand tools, the hammers, the, even the nail that you use. Yeah. Which it, it seems very You very can't powerful. actually not use the nail and use some. Yeah, but it's, you know, it, it, it like shows brass, you that. Like a brass, yeah. That but it, work, it works for me, so. Well, yeah, and, and at the end of the day, if it works and the result is being, being had, right. it, it's quite nice to actually see a nail being used in the process. It, it, it just says a lot about the skill um, that you have. Oh, what's it got? A. Co uh, 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 uh. Oh, don't spoil the A illusion. copper one. <laughs> don't spoil the illusion. A it's copper the punch. <laughs> but it's just, uh, oh, I found it worked. So. Yeah. Right, now we um, got to clean it up, basically. Trying to make it flush with the metal. I feel a bit rushed there. Because <laughs> this is actually a long process, the whole gun. Uh, when we're trying to do this in half an hour, it's like, <laughs> that's why I only picked out a little bit that we're doing. Yeah. So you literally go through the stones. There's, this is a coarse, coarser stone. Just take out the bolt. I'll just do a little bit. So you're aiming just to Date the gold out and not, not anything else. But if you can see, not yet. Right, you can start seeing where the metal is. If I point it out. So we've got the gold, and these bits here are the actually the undercut where I threw it up. But that's a guide of how far you've got to go down. So we'll keep doing that until that's literally disappeared. Let's make it flush. So the whole process, let's just take this gold inlay for the whole gun that you're doing now. How long do you reckon? What, just the gold? Just the gold. Uh, at least 150 hours. Just for the gold? Just for the gold. Um, maybe a bit longer because this is rose gold. It's actually a bit more difficult to get in. Because what I've done, this bit is straight. Yep. So it's, it's more straightforward. Then you've got the leaves. Yeah. You've got the but when you start coming around these bits, it's a bit more difficult because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more process no, to do than that, rather than just pull it in because I have to reinforce that somehow. And then the scroll? The scroll, if you're just looking at the scroll, mm. the scroll work on, uh, what's this, uh, 20 ball? Yeah, 20 ball over. Uh, 20 ball and an old over, uh, just a small scroll, you're looking about 140 hours of work. There you go. Just a small scroll. So in entirety, this gun, you're looking at 260 hours of handwork. If not more. If not more. There you go. Well, I said, um, no. Do you enjoy it? Yeah. yeah. It must be incredibly sad. I actually enjoy doing small scroll. Mm -hmm. um, 
just small scroll because um, it's not on your bench for too long. Mm -hmm. um, when you start doing the more elaborate stuff mm. with last scroll and game scenes, you're looking at three, four hundred hours. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on what you do. Five, six, but if you, regions, right? if you if you start going into carving, you know, I once had a gun on my bench for six six months, and uh, that's why I got no hair left. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got that. Um, no, it's really interesting to hear actually, because yeah, I guess if you're looking at the same job all day for six months. But there was a lot of carving in that mm. involved. Mm. So, right, we've gone through the. The heavy stone. Now we use a softer one. Moving across the water. Yeah, this is water-based stone. This stone is actually water-based, so we're using water. Need to change the water as well. I haven't actually changed it. It's actually <laughs> it's the dish. That's a bit manky. So. Charles the fire. So. <laughs> I just had a message coming through saying hello from Stefano Pedretti. Oh, is it? Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, this is, yeah. Just mentioning uh, my good friend Stefano Pedretti uh, out in Italy, uh, another one of our engravers that we, we work and know with. Um, so, yeah, thank you, for, thank you for watching. Oh, Stefano on? Yeah, Stefano. Hi, oh, Stefano. <laughs> How you doing? All right. <laughs> Stefano. Um, and his father. Um, I really like your work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so St Stefano's father was actually the, the very first Italian engraver to, to engrave a Purdy. And um, it's really, really very nice, actually, to be able to continue to work with him through my career and um, onwards. So uh, welcome to this Instagram Live. Are you doing one? Huh? Is he doing one? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Uh, yeah, so we would just continue until the undercut mark is gone. It's quite a long process, so shall I carry on or, or what? <laughs> yeah, I think we're probably coming to the end actually because we, we are um, running on a little bit. Yeah, so. so I'll continue doing that until that highlight is gone on the edge. Um, but that's the finished product basically. Yeah. So um, there you go. Sure. Um, so this is something I've done earlier, uh, the rose gold, um, that's finished, that's been cut back, all flush. And actually, that's actions by Ian Brunt, our action fighter who we saw a couple of months ago. So it's a legend. You can <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how it transfers on down the factory and, and where we get to. So um, thank you very much, Paul. Really Mark, you're welcome. Once again, I've learned something. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for your beautiful work. So, no, thanks. <laughs> thank you, everybody, once again for joining us. Um, this is actually number seven. Um, so one more to go. Um, the art of finishing. I call it art because I'm a finisher. And I like it. <laughs> you doing it? Yeah. Uh, possibly not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for joining us, and thanks again, Paul. Um, so yeah, keep tuned uh, to our Instagram uh, Instagram page, um, where we'll be announcing the uh, quite, un quite sadly actually the, the last part of this series. So until uh, we see you next time, stay safe and um, take care. Bye. Bye.